everybody. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Psychedelics Today in Breckenridge, Colorado. Hope you're having a beautiful day out there. Today on the show, we have Tep. Tep is a chemical engineer from SoCal and is a uh, really interesting person to talk to. She's got some deep experience in the um, kind of EDM and rave scene and uh, was kind of curious to talk to me about that and about how there's sometimes not much knowledge about these worlds uh, in the other worlds. So for instance, the research world and the rave world don't know too much about each other and perhaps there's some lessons to learn there. Yeah, that's why we chatted and um, we get into some interesting material that I don't believe we've ever talked about on the show before and it was pretty fun. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I I think we're going to have tap on again in the future, get more into some other stuff and yeah, I think that's about it. So enjoy this episode with tap. If you want to support our show, we've got, uh, you probably got a few days left um, to sign up for our live supported Navigating Psychedelics course that starts on the 11th or 12th. Depending on which edition you take, you can find out more from our website, psychedelicstoday.com. We'd love to have you join us for the live supported class and pretty much think it's the best way to get a solid foundation in psychedelia. This is an enormous field and it's really hard to get your bearings. There's so many opinions, so much science and pseudoscience and just straight mythology and religion. And, and how do you deal with all of that? It's not that religion's bad or mythology's bad. It's just how do we contextualize that so we can make uh, appropriate decisions around drugs. So thank you all for joining us and hope to see you on the other side and next week. This is Joe signing off. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Tep. Tep is a, let's chemical see, engineer. chemical engineer <laughs> by training <laughs> with a fair yes. amount of um, information to share about you know recreational use, what that looks like. And that's kind of the thing that brought us together, right? You kind of reached out to say, hey, I'd like to just discuss this because the worlds don't seem to know each other very well. Mm-hmm. They're- is a, there's a big um, gap between this realm of communities that have similar commonalities of psychedelics where the music industry um, or festivals and raves and such have a different uh, way of thinking of psychedelics. And then there's like the side of um, like medicinal and therapy and scientific research and biohacking and you know, exploration of the mind and all, all sorts of, uh, different communities. Um, but there's just a huge gap between, um, those, even though they have a a very similar commonality. And so I wanted to talk about that today with you. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be really cool. So last time, so we, we thankfully got to chat for a while, um, a week or two ago, maybe. And, it was pretty fun because we got to chat about all these differences and like, you know, I'm in this kind of jam band style world with like fish and whatever, you know, funk bands. And it, it looks like a very specific kind of party. There's typically very specific kinds of drugs there. Um, mm-hmm. And I know you're not necessarily purely like a, you know, a bass head, like a bass nectar person, but, <laughs> but you kind of bounce around like different circles than I do. So, so your experiences are slightly different. Um, yeah. And I have, uh, you know, my first exposure was like more purely like EDM, you know, like the, the stuff you'd like listen to, at, like the Vegas clubs. Right. <laughs> and, uh, that would be like the more modern raves that are look like a carnival with a bunch of led lights. And then, um, but then I also love like my, you know, I love jam band stuff too. I love all kinds of mixed music that you would see, um, at like uh, other festivals where it's usually like camping and more use of, uh, you know, a different traditional psychedelics. Um, but there's even like a rap and like, uh, you know, jazz and everything. So I like a lot of the uh, different genres, but yes, I do love bass sector. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> You know, obviously, there's a there's a whole spectrum of drug use at like a recreational environment, right? There's like, you know, maybe you take half a piece of ecstasy and that's it. 
Maybe you're mm-hmm. t- taking a whole bunch of stuff like ketamine, acid, ecstasy, and drinking a lot, um, and uh-huh. smoking a lot of weed. Yeah. Like there, it's a whole spectrum, right? It doesn't need to be like on one side or the other. And there's folks that mix, but don't mix at high levels, too. Yeah, yeah, and and there's a lot of like people that uh, you know, there's different people that are like very like thoughtful of what they're mixing and there's people that don't even care. They're just like, Oh, you have some, like I will take some of that right now. (laughs) And so they're not even aware of what they're mixing together and the quality of it. And so then they're going to have a different experience, obviously. Yeah. So what in particular did it, like occurred to you? Did you see something in particular at a show that kind of said these people don't really understand or is it just people you were bumping into didn't seem to um, understand that there was research underway and and really serious Um, research? Well, so I, I, when I got like introduced to psychedelics, it was more of, you know, what was considered like recreational, you know, just going there and it's something to like, you know, you know, kind of like alcohol where you use to like, you know, loosen up a little bit and get into the same mind uh, state as everyone else. But then I just saw myself making these bonds and connections with people that would, were like closer than people that I would, you know, have uh, relationships with people outside of um, psychedelics that I've known them for years and still have never grown that close of a bond. And so, you know, having a little bit of um, a scientific background, um, just my research online, I stumbled across, you know, how there's, you know, the MAPS organization and all of these, you know, uh, people using this for therapy and medicinal research and uh, developing new medicines and understanding the mind. And so then I, you know, would talk at festivals about them and they you know, there was no under, there was no knowledge of that. And so, cause I was like, Oh, I don't know if you want to mix those two right now. You, you know, you might get this, you know, bad experience. And so they're like, why though? And so then I understood that there was not an understanding of, um, how the substances are affecting your mind. Um, and then there is not, um, a lot of awareness that, people are trying to use this for medicine and not just recreational use. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, (laughs) I typically don't have the opportunity to actually talk about that kind of stuff when I'm, on a show. <laughs> like, yeah, and that, that it's funny because you, cause you said like fish, right? Right. And, and and those ones are like you're really focused on like the music, and I feel like like because when I go to a bass nectar concert is what I want to like. I feel like is where we overlap the most in like having you know that that um that connection because you're really using the psychedelic and it enhances your connection with the music and your interpretation and, um, you know, the lights and whatever and the lyrics. But when you're at festivals, like you have the opportunity to talk to people and, you know, do things with the, like interact with them and have conversation rather than just consistent listening to music or, you know, a one single show. Right. Yeah. That's huge. It's really huge. Um, it's, yeah, like we have this festival here, Sonic Bloom, that I think it would be perfect for. It's an EDM festival where folks have workshops the whole time. Mm-hmm. So so you could actually book a spot and um, people are doing like yoga workshops, breath work, all this other yeah. you know, interesting stuff. And drug education is pretty key there. So any festival I that's like, that. you know, yeah, totally. And I think Arise does the same thing. That's another Colorado festival. It's not, not as EDM, but it's... Um, it's kind of like a nice family friendly uh, mm-hmm. three, four day festival. It's pretty big, honestly. Um, yeah. So like there is a place for this kind of education. It's just um, hard to fit it into like, you know, um, and a three day run or something. And it's happening. Like, uh, you know, there's, you know, harm reduction. They always have like, you know, a tent or a setup on, you know, um, but you don't, you don't traditionally see like um, the, 
like scientific like research people there because their mission isn't to really necessarily associate with them. Like I don't want to say it in that manner, but like uh, people, you know, give like festival goers this, you know, um, kind of like identity and they don't, they want to stay away from uh, being a recreational party drug and like focus on the research of this medicine. So you're not going to see like, you know, a maps booth usually at a rave or festival (laughs) and it's totally understandable. Um, but like ones that I would, uh, like relate to the ones that you were talking about where there's like, you know, um, different little sessions where they can really be integrated, um, that I know of are like electric forest and Bonnaroo. Those are my favorites. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And those have a lot of, uh, a a lot more overlap. And, uh, I like to kind of call it more, have like more of a, like a hippie vibe. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Have you, have you actually encountered any Zendo project tents anywhere you've been festival wise? I have, I'm like a part of the community of volunteering, but I haven't like actually gone and done the volunteering. Right. Um, they actually get the, the spots fill up very quickly. It's like hard to get in. <laughs> right. It's um, pretty competitive. Yeah. And so like I, you know, have been, I, I've been in a lot of these uh, different psychedelic communities a lot, a lot, but I'm still, you know, uh, dedicating my, my opportunities to, to contribute in other ways. But I definitely approve of that project. That is amazing. And I love what they're doing. And, um, I hope to see them at more, um, festivals than the ones that they have been able to go to because the ones that, uh, you know, like uh, the ones that I've heard they are listed under like lightning a bottle is like the closest one that could be um, like closer to a festival or, or rave that like is more um, known. Whereas the other ones, like I don't think that they're more typically known outside of um, um, that, that scene, I guess, so to say. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting situation. Like we really need to see more of these kind of harm reduction tents at festivals where, where people can like get saved a little bit because having Mm -hmm. a bad situation pop up can be, you know, pretty troubling. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, I personally had one somewhat recently and thankfully a bunch of my friends were around (laughs) and, and it wasn't such a big situation. It, it looked pretty mm-hmm. bad, but it was... Um, what was uh, the situation, if you don't oh, mind me just, asking? Uh, <laughs> far too much acid, and I was not, okay. I was not ready for it. Um, I was like, okay, I could do a little I, bit, but I can't do like 12 hits right now. Um, yeah, I can relate. <laughs> but it was kind of forced on me in, in an interesting way. I'm um, not really forced. I... I pretty much said yes. <laughs> I didn't say no, but, um, you, you know, were socially pressured. <laughs> right, right, right. And, um, the problem, the biggest problem being that we didn't really know the dosage. Um, oh. right. So like two drops, but really times two oh. or more per. Okay. So, so no blotters. You guys are going right. for liquid. This was, <laughs> so I actually think liquid LSD in a, in a festival environment is a little risky. Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Just purely around overdosing. Um, this mm-hmm. one particular uh, festival I do is on a cruise boat and it <gasps> like imagine doing too much acid there. And the consequences oh, are that you get removed from the boat. Like they, they bring you to your, their little hospital room and let you ride it out there, which probably sucks. And yeah. then, um, then you get removed. Is it called friendship? Uh, uh-uh. um, it's the same company that does Holy ship. Oh, are you okay? I've done Holy ship. Yeah. They, 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 they stopped, but <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> they had a couple too many situations. This one's like an older crowd and it's kind of champions. Um, okay. And, uh, so yeah, I've seen people get removed, and it's pretty ugly. Um, yeah, I've seen it like uh, 
like I've seen people get removed because it's just, it's too much. They have to go to the medical tent and then they get removed. And then I've uh, seen the tents where they're cleverly named. I can't remember it right now, but they're like, you go in and it's like pink and there's like teddy bears and like everything just really like uh, childlike to bring you out of your trip. It's mm. like cuddle. I think it's like a cuddle huddle or some type of like place like that, or it's really cutesy so that you can get out of your bad trip. So they don't really take you to like a medical place and like isolate you and like have all these strangers staring at you <laughs> that are wearing like very official wear, but they um, are there just to like, Hey, how are you doing? It's okay. Do you want a hug? <laughs> <laughs> and I like love that. <laughs> right. It's mm-hmm. often very simple um, to to do kind of like a festival harm reduction um, mm-hmm. and pull somebody out. Like uh, kind of the first yeah. thing we do typically is just change environment or at least look 90 degrees or 180 degrees in the opposite direction for a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. see if that helps. And then, you know, just slightly removing yourself from where you're at somewhere. It's a little mm-hmm. less stressful, um, mm-hmm. people you trust. So it's not so scary. And, um, yeah. yeah. Or, well, you know, so what me and my friends like to do, cause like, you know, we're, it's associated with this, this, uh, you know, environment of like peace, love and unity and respect. And so my group, um, you know, my best fam, uh, so to say, like if we see someone that's having like a terrible, like, I don't, we don't know if like they're just sad or if they're having a bad trip, but they're by themselves. We'll always just like, you know, casually, you know, we'll always like just sit by them and be like, Hey man, like, how's your, are you okay? You want to go for a walk with us or join our group? And they'll be like, okay. Usually they say like, okay, you know, and then like <laughs> we help them find their friend right. or they end up joining us or, you know, it always like, the culture is really loving and it, um, it doesn't have to be a specific group. It's just like the community is just like helping each other out, which I think is really, really nice. Yeah, totally. Totally. Like people can do it themselves. Like you don't need a full yeah. organization. Yeah. Just be nice. Yeah. No, and there's, and there's, there's like people that do, um, like their festival fam is like to make sure to go around and like hydrate people Mm. and to go and like make sure people are having a good time and they wear special like shirts that they created. And I like it's and it's totally not an organization at all. And they just, that's just their like the thing that they do when they go to festivals. It's the best. (laughs) Like I love that. (laughs) That's pretty incredible. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. They just go around and like hand out like water and it's like, and I'm like, you, you paid here to enjoy yourself at this event and you're acting like staff. And it's just like, so like amazing that people want to contribute that way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so like what, what kind of big things, um, beyond what we talked about so far, would you, would you like to see, you know, being made available just like pamphlet stations or like, I don't know. Um, I can imagine things for ages, but I don't know what kind of things are in your mind. Mm, I don't think pamphlets maybe aren't the way to reach most people. I mean, like a lot of the reason why I would love to do this podcast is because, you know, this is going to be put online and then I can spread it, you know, to my, you know, festival goer friends. And hopefully this information gets spread like through media. Um, and just um, just education wise. And so I think that those things are effective, but like the most effective ways probably would, would be, um, learning it on your own through media. And uh, I don't think, I think that, um, tents and stuff like that would be really great and all very, you know, contribute. But I think that to the magnitude that it needs to be, um, you know, this digital, um, connection would be a lot, uh, more successful. Right. Absolutely. Cause you, you know, learning on site <laughs> isn't, isn't too easy, right? Yeah. You've got your whole p- yeah. game plan. And- yeah. You have a game plan. You have the music that you want to listen to, you know, the friends that you need to make sure that you meet up that like you met last year and connected with, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so like when I go by a booth, like, 
it's like, it's really like, I only really stop at like, Ooh, this is shiny. (laughs) You know, like I don't really go like, Ooh, this is like, this is educational. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I would love that. I would love that though. (laughs) I think, I think you're right. Like it has to be like preparation. You have to learn it ahead of time for the most part. Um, Mm -hmm. or at least somebody there (laughs) can Mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, learn. And I think that like, you know, like, 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 you know, when people say like, like base heads, um, and, and dead heads and like, you know, people that have these huge followings, like those people, I think like they listen to, like, they'll follow them every tweet that they say, they will know what they tweeted in the last like two seconds. And then we'll repost it on Instagram saying like, Oh my gosh, base nectar likes the purple the color purple, <laughs> you know? And so I think that a message from like these people at the top, um, you know, if they just, ta- if they talked about that for a second, um, which they do usually, you know, they talk about more so like harm reduction, but if they were to talk about the scientific research part of things, I think that would open a lot more minds. And then, you know, a lot of these people too, generally in my scene are also younger so they could you can you know have people create careers out of this thing that they revolve their life around and to spawn in this community and if they talked about the psychedelic research rather than just the harm reduction then it could have more of an effect in a positive direction yeah, that would be really big. And it, it's interesting, right? Because they've got these record deals that they they might get in trouble, some of the smaller artists at least, for chatting about it. But realistically would they? Exactly. That's the question. You know, <laughs> perhaps they're afraid. Um but I, I just knows? think that's like like I don't think anyone would get dinged for like oh you talked about scientific research on right. psychedelics, like, you know. Um, and then there's like people like, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure the whole story, but how like Diplo is like, you know, bans, you know, is very open to like banding complete psychedelic use and any drug usage at his events. So it's but like alcohol only. It's just alcohol. Yeah. Jesus. And like they, you're not, you're not, they're not, I remember I went to one of his like things when I was uh, like in my college years and he, uh, they took away our her bracelets, the candy, because it was too associated with, with, uh, like, you know, drugs or whatever. And I was like, what, you're going to take away this, you know, I don't collect them anymore, but I used to. <laughs> and I was like, but I got these at special moments from special people, you know? And, and then we couldn't go into the show without taking them off and trashing them. And so right. like, Sorry, Diplo had to say that on the podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Like what is, what do you think drove that for him to make a statement like that when, when we kind of know alcohol is the most dangerous of them? Well, I don't think maybe he knows that. Right. Like that's, this is another thing. Like a lot of people are like, what you're just to be honest, if I go to, you know, a bar, like, the substance I'm going to take is probably not going to be alcohol, (laughs) but I will hang out. And because I am aware of David Nutt's work of saying that the most scientifically proven that alcohol is the worst for you and for the people around you. But a lot of people don't know that alcohol is worse than all of these other, you know, psychedelics. Right. And so maybe he wanted to get away from drug use being associated with music because he wanted to be purely about just the music. And it's right. just, it's too integrated into each other. And so he's gotten, you know, a lot of backlash, but I just, I think it's a contradiction to allow alcohol. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, and I don't know, maybe if it's outdoors, like vaping, I don't know if, you know, they do that, but. I don't know where Diplo plays. I don't, I don't follow. I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I like, was kind of curious about Diplo like five years ago, but I'm like, oh. yeah, all right. Probably <laughs> still will never see you alive. <laughs> Everyone's like, we need to make it to the Diplo stage. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> like I really want to listen to like 
some uh, any, anyone else. <laughs> so being in Southern California, did have you been to Coachella? You know, it's funny. I have not. Okay. <laughs> and reasons being, because kind of mentioned before, when we, we talked before, I just really love that, like, the hippie vibe of things and then having like the, the overnight tenting. And I, I think they, do they camp at Coachella? Oof. You know, like I don't think VIP so. I think camping with have, like <laughs> expensive like, TPs. They, they glamp. Yeah. They glamp. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like Coachella to me is like more I'm, like, sorry people, <laughs> but to, to me, it's like uh, the mainstream people, the mainstream artists. And then like a lot of like, um, structures that you can take pictures with um and um it has less of a a home environment and then there's less use of the psychedelic uh the psychedelics that um i usually like to do it's more like alcohol and uh mdma on that side of the world right um and then they incorporate like a lot of rap and EDM only. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm just not really familiar with Coachella. It was not not much of an interest for me. Whenever I see uh, the lineup, which lineup is never even really my main concern. Right. My main concern is like what friends are showing up. <laughs> the lineup is my friends. <laughs> right. Absolutely. No. Yeah. It's it's just such a mainstream festival that you you wouldn't really see that there. Um, I imagine it's a different environment at something like EDC, which is still super mainstream, yeah. but it's um, it's kind of designed around that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like really, really long days. And it's, and it's like kind of like, I mean, it's like bro you know? Sure. And like also when I'm like, I don't know if you have this same experience, but if I'm tripping on something that's kind of more, maybe like I would characterize as like, like deep, like more like like psilocybin and LSD and something. And if I encounter a conversation with them and I've had this happen to me, um, I, I'm having this, you know, conversation with a person and then like there's, I notice that they're slurring and then I notice like certain things that are off and then I find out that they're actually like inebriated in the sense of alcohol. And then I'm like, oh, I get super uncomfortable. Um and I just, I like, I can't be around, um, people that are like drunk when I'm on these, like, you know, more like hugging type of psychedelics. And so that's why I tend to not go to, you know, raves and any, and then like the Coachella type quote unquote festivals. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, the people who are just like over the line drunk can can be very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. I totally agree with you on that. Um, yeah, and then people on their phones, <laughs> like, oh, I'm like put your phone away, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. That's kind of like a for those who don't know, it's a really good idea just to like hide your phone <laughs> for a while and yeah, and just and, let it go. And, and a good thing about festivals is that if you lose your phone, you're more likely to get it returned. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just the vibe, you know, it's just a, a more, there's more love. I feel like, you know, don't mean to, uh, completely, uh, stereotype it, but it, that's my, my personal experiences have been more positive at uh, festivals. <laughs> right. I a thing that comes up on the show often is this idea that that festival use or just recreational use has no therapeutic properties at all. Um, mm-hmm. Celebratory use, you know, uh, Doblin tried to re- reframe it that way a while back. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think there that needs to be discussed more. Um, yes. What do you have any kind of I, thoughts about? Like, you know, do you feel better for a few weeks after a festival? Or what do you, how do you approach yes. that? Okay. I would love to, to, to approach this right now. <laughs> um, so like, I think that a lot of people, they go to a festival and they just feel so refreshed. It's like their Christmas of the year. Right. And, but 
you know, it wasn't because they had this vacation. It was because they had this beautiful experience, but then they also had this, you know, um, these, these therapeutic effects from the medicines and that they will linger on, you know, for, for weeks or months maybe. And then they want to go to another festival because they want that same effect. And so that's why, um, when I was, you know, talking to you, you know, weeks before the, I want to talk about the terminology used between the usage being recreational and then medicinal. And I really think that there's just so much overlap, even though those are totally separate too, because, you know, you could, it doesn't have to be even like a psychedelic experience. If you're going to just have a vacation or anything, you're still having these chemical releases in your mind of, you know, like of serotonin and your dopamine and you're having a good time and that's can be therapeutic in a way, or let's say there's no psychedelics involved and you're going to like a retreat where you're meditating. Um, you're still having, you know, these chemical reactions in your brain that are translating into some type of therapy and now can be categorized then as medicinal. And so that's where I think that those two things are, are very closely related, even though they're like segregated when you talk about them, when you go to like, you know, a weed store, they're like, okay, are you buying recreational? Or are you buying medicinal? And it's like, well, I personally think that you can, like, I want to go to the festival and rave scene. And I want to say, look, not only can these uh, psychedelics be fun, but they can also be therapeutic. And then to the other side of the community, that's like more about therapy and medicinal use. I want to be like, not only can this be therapeutic, but this can be super fun too, <laughs> you know? And so I just really think that those overlap the, and if we're taking them recreationally, that a lot of times we are subconsciously using them therapeutically and medicinally. So there's a, a gentleman, I don't, I don't know the name of the organization or the person, but he's doing um, veteran reintegration through music and festivals. So like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, I think it's probably below the radar, but bringing folks to festivals, probably, probably MDMA and, and LSD involved, maybe mushrooms. And, that being a way of like, <laughs> it's probably a lot easier to do that than to get somebody to go to a therapist office. Um, I would say it's certainly not applicable for everybody, but yeah. And, and, you know, so what I'm doing is, uh, when I'm reading the clinical trials, um, of them, you know, saying like, Oh, would it be better if the therapists were there or if they're not, or if they're talking or if there's two people or one person, or like the underground stuff where it's like they're on MDMA and the person who is also you the therapist or the guider is also on MDMA. Like, I think that there's a totally different um, effect on my mind personally when I take a substance with or without someone. And then like, you know, set and setting always being like, you know, talked about. And so like what that guy's doing is like, I would love to get that guy's name and understand more about what he's doing. Because I think that when we start seeing the day that there are therapeutic centers that you can go to, um, I feel like I ho I'm, I'm hoping that it doesn't just, you know, look like a, a medical clinic or uh, like a hippie style clinical settings. Like I hope that there's still a lot of this, all of these features that like you'd find at like kind of a festival that make it fun so that you're not, it's not just um, this really hardcore serious therapy session, you know? Yeah, that's huge. Um, I'll see what I can do to find that person's info. It was very roundabout the way I found it. But, uh, <laughs> Love it. Would love it. Would I love think there that. needs to be, you know, uh, maps would love, uh, you know what? No, I can't even say that. You know, the role maps has to play is, is this one that, that <laughs> is very specific that helps get things, get things through, you know, drug approval mm -hmm. and, 
Yeah. And it's not necessarily yeah. the same organization that should be mm-hmm. pressing for uh, reform and rights elsewhere. Right. Like, yeah, no, the, this, this, this like integration, you know, and, and maybe like closing the gap, the gap between these communities has to be done from the festival side of the world. Um, and maybe like the, the middle ground, um, like therapeutic and medicinal, like integration people, it could definitely not be done by the people that are trying to get FDA approval because they have to stay 100% white label and they can't have any association with the gray market or the black market or anything, you know, that is not, um, about pure science and medicine and treatment. And it's just like my personal opinion. And like, you know, I have friends that are doing startups that have to go through the FDA process of getting things approved and you, they have to put on their suit and tie, even though like they're, they're really chill, they back people, but like they have to put on their suit and tie because they have to follow this certain guidelines to get approved. And so there's no room for error because then all of this work is wasted. It's too, it's too much risk. So they just, they can't come from maps. Maps. I like, I would just, I would disapprove maps showing up at a festival. (laughs) Right. And maps thankfully, thankfully has that sub project Zendo, um, which does, which they fund. Yes. um, And it's essentially part of maps. I guess it's just their festival branch where they're like, Okay, have fun, but like here's yeah, the rules yeah. you should play by. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then they they did a beautiful job of that. And it's a, um, I, I hope to uh, volunteer um, and and be able to contribute in that. Have in that you ever sense. bumped into um, Dance Safe at a festival? Yes, and like it's hard to recall like this memory, but I, I definitely. Dance Safe and Zendo are the ones that I know. Uh, outside of that, are those little festival family groups that just do it, like for fun. Like that is, they do that at the festivals. Um, and so yeah, Dance Safe and Zendo are the primary ones that I okay, know. Yeah, I think Dance Safe does a great job. I'm a big fan of their work. They have these kind of cards that they hand out, and it's it's kind of like a micro pamphlet. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And the design is kind of cool enough mm-hmm. to watch or look at at least. And uh, one of the mm-hmm. things I learned and started sharing with folks uh, from the the map uh, from the dance safe cards is around, um, I think hepatitis transmission through through like you know nose <laughs> related drugs, right? So like if you're all mm-hmm. sharing the same tools, there's a good chance you might you know get exposed, right? Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I, you know I thankful for that shared it with some friends who are just you know going to town on cocaine and i'm like what are you you guys sure <laughs> you guys all have your own uh spoons or whatever, right <laughs> um and they're like no of course not. they're like no we're using yeah. we're using 10 caps right, right. we had a <laughs> that we found off the ground so you know it, it's it's a tough conversation uh, like even though I'm kind of in this harm reduction world and, and have all this knowledge, I can't necessarily even convince my closest or close friends, you know? So it's like a, that is something that, that would probably bother a lot of folks. It bothers me a little bit, but not a ton. Yeah. And it's, you know, we've encountered, um, like situations, um, cause like I'm a part of this group that kind of, like I have like a, in terms like a, a very close knit, like fest fam. And then I have like a larger one where I don't even know everyone, you know, but we're just like all on the same group page and we organize and, and help each other. But like the, you can't have that. Dis- usually that like, discussion doesn't really go well during a festival and maybe at the campsite when everything's like really chill, <laughs> someone wants to talk about it, but not for like a long duration of time. And then like, you know, that memory might just be like something that fades because they just went through a whole festival experience. Like their, their, you know, drain, their, their brain needs to have some sleep, you know, <laughs> that's just not, um, it's a hard way of, of spreading knowledge. It really has to be done. I think through like, the most effective way is like through right, media right, like right. This. So not totally pushy, but like informative. Like if you're 
If you're okay with a hepatitis yeah, risk, there. cool, yeah. but at least know about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I was really lucky to come across this right. group that I, that I fell into. So like, like I went to, when I first uh, went to like rave and festivals, I had no friends interested in going with me. So I got a ticket to EDC was actually my first one. It's like, right. Yeah. Very basic. <laughs> um, but I got a ticket. I just really wanted to do it. Uh, I got a ticket. I had no ride there. I had no hotel and I just, uh, went. And then this, like, you know, this group just like, they just embraced me after they heard that I had, like, cause I just wrote on Facebook was like, Hey, I just want to do this. And like, does anyone have any suggestions or like, does, can I, can I hitch a ride with anyone coming from this part of the area? And then I just got like completely embraced by like this, like little, you know, little rave fam. Uh, It was your first story of going and like, it it seemed like you had zero infrastructure for going to the show. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anything about anything. And so like, um, but then I, then I, came across this other family site. So I moved, right. So I, I did that when I was in college and then I moved to Texas and I started going to more of the festival type things. And when I went there, I bonded more closely with people that were like, uh, maybe a decade, uh, or two like above me. And so I got introduced into taking how to do the, the whole system of psychedelics in a very safe manner and thoughtful manner and so for a while i thought that that was just already known and then when i started like hanging out with my younger side and of the crew then i realized that there was a lot of um knowledge that wasn't understood about you know the quality of the drugs how we were you know how they were getting it how they were transporting it how are they were distributing it um like like everything from a to z the the knowledge was just um severely a lot less from the community the little small little little test fam that i had uh, originally came from and so I try to you know to do my best to spread the knowledge that we need to be doing better, but you know, that, you know, obviously the outreach is going to be very small and will affect very few people. So this is great that we're right, having at this least conversation. you can say, Hey, go check out this website, <laughs> look for TEP and you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <sighs> let's see. I, I, I kind of would like to jump a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of curious about these exotic molecules that we chatted about. Oh yeah. The analog. Right. So we just had a whole bunch of people request, uh, an episode on more exotic compounds recently. Mm-hmm. I love how you call them exotic. <laughs> They're just not there. Right. So like, what's the term? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nah, well, yeah, I guess I, I love exotic. Um, but like, I guess the, um, like scientific way of describing that is um, just analogs of the traditional tryptamines. And so they're, you know, of the same family, but have a little bit different um, chemical structure. And that also makes them also, you know, not illegal technically. And then, you know, taking them, you obviously are having a different experience because it's a different compound. Right. So this person called it Shulgin's magical half dozen, <laughs> which is interesting. Yeah. Um, so like 2CB. Okay. Um, okay. I personally give it a <laughs> thumbs up. It's amazing. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. what about this one? 2CT2. <laughs> Have you heard of this one? No, two C T two. I actually have. I'm I'm still getting uh, familiar with all of the. Uh, you can only trip so much, right? Right, right. <laughs> and so, although I, you know, both might have like uh, a knowledge background on it, I haven't necessarily taken all of uh, the ones listed <laughs> that Shulgin has uh, produced. <laughs> it's a pretty pretty nice long list, and so. 
one of those uh, checklist items, like a, like almost like that I treat like a, a bucket list <laughs> that like I will do it eventually, but you know, at the right time. Right. It's like the <laughs> farmer's guide to novel compounds. Yeah, but I but I agree with you on the the two CB. Um, I'm a, I am a fan. I like that um, having a more of a, a home and nurturing like loving vibe than also being like very like almost like a shorter acid trip <laughs> and that like more visual like more the colors pop more I would say personally. And yeah, I just really appreciate that shorter duration of time while being really closely uh, related to the character of LSD. Cool. And I, I like that, how it's like, you can get that in a press. So, <laughs> right. That's helpful. That's helpful. Yeah. Right? It's very helpful. Yes. <laughs> um, so these two are kind of common, um, but 4-H-O-M-E-T or 4-H-O-M-I-P-T. Have you, have you tried mm-hmm. either of those? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like to. So what I started off doing um, was because you know I have my favorites, and um, you know mushrooms, psilocybin, psilocin, you know, are are my favorites. My, my, my favorite compound, along with you know like DMT and the NBNA. So I tend to oh, and uh, ketamine. So it's kind of a you know not your traditionally categorized as a psychedelic one but um i like to try the analogs of those and so that's where my journey has begun (laughs) and uh so like same kind of thing where it's um it just it's similar but it just it has this different uh it definitely you can tell definitely tell there's differences in them but I, I still prefer the traditional um, on most of those. I still, huh. I still ch- will prefer, like, uh, I, I mean, I actually, I don't know why, even though they're the same chemical compounds, but I, I prefer truffles over mushrooms. <laughs> really? So, like, the the stuff you would find in Netherlands? Yeah, essentially? that's Claratia. The, they're, the, they're the same. It's made out of the same, you know, spore prints and everything, and they're just uh, treated differently. It's kind of like drinking matcha tea and green tea. They're the, sa- the same plant, um, but they're just um, like made. They're bred differently. Like the the matcha, they put in the shade, and it generates more chlorophyll. And then you grind it up into a powder, so you still have all the fiber. And then whereas like. You know, the the green tea is like left in the light and dried out in the sun. And then you like steep it in tea and you you take out the fiber, you know. And so I feel like that's how I feel about scoleratia, a.k.a. you know, magic truffles um, versus like uh, mushrooms or um, mushroom tea and stuff like that. Well, that's really cool. Um, I know a number of people who are doing above ground mushroom therapy with the sclerotia. Mm -hmm. Uh, And for those who don't really know, yeah, it's like a truffle that grows underground. It's essentially an energy store for the plant, uh, for the mushroom. Um, And it looks like a potato almost when you pull it out, like an ugly potato or something. I like, I like, I think they look like walnuts and it kind of tastes like (laughs) walnuts. They have the consistency of walnuts. I mean, well, it sounds like yours are outdoor. Because they're big. Ah, uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like. I I love all the natural stuff, but I do like isolation of the you know what chemicals are going to be you know acting as the feed and stuff like that. Right. And so um, I tend to come across the smaller bits rather than the big potato. <laughs> right, right, right. That's cool. Um, do you, do you have them dry or wet? I always do, but yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think things just change. They change over, you know, there's, there's a less loss uh, after aging. With a lot of drugs, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, just, there's, you know, light and, you know, and then your moisture, the, they change 
them to sometimes even have no psychedelic properties at all anymore. So, you know, after oxidation, stuff like that. So I like to have it nice and fresh. (laughs) So with something like LSD, which apparently is super sensitive, how would you prefer to um, store that? LSD? Right. In in particular, just because it's kind of like a sensitive Mm -hmm. molecule. Uh, that one, like really, I just like, I just make sure that it's, you know, as little air possible inside of some kind of Ziploc type of structure, but it has to, I I make sure that like, there is no UV light going to be able to, to penetrate through. Cause I think that light, you know, but, but generally, you know, depending on what your climate it is, like I, I'm pretty sure it's like dry, very dry in Colorado, right? Right. So then, like you know, your air that's that even that get does get trapped in there. It's not much moisture, like so a dust can pack it would be nice, but you don't need it. And then probably you don't want it to have like any contact with the blotter, or if you're talking about liquid, then just like keep it in its container and then just make sure it's not like so as to light because. Um, and then like, you know, people were like, well, it wasn't in direct sunlight, but like you could still have like indirect UV light or any, like any frequency could actually really influence degradation. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Where else do we want to go? Anything else you're feeling? Hmm. Well, I have written here, like the use of, uh, I think we covered everything, but a little bit less of um, going into like scientific research and how it like kind of branches off into developing new medicines that will cure like illnesses such as like depression and then traumatic effects like PTSD and then branching off into like just the understanding of the mind and consciousness and then receptor uh, reaction or the, the, the role of how uh, receptors played based on what your foundation of your original like format is mapped out. But, you know, that might be a whole different conversation because <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> okay. So the way I understand it is certain receptor sites get hit and there's, that's an overlay with a certain type of therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, you know, there's all sorts of different avenues of research, right? Uh Like I want to probably have this conversation again, more expanded, Yeah, but it's pretty interesting. We can do another Um, podcast. Let's talk about it lightly now. Maybe we can get to part two. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's a good idea. (laughs) Yeah. So what, what part of uh, it did you want to touch? I, you know, anything, um, science for a lot of folks is really hard to deal with cause it's so slow and it's so like, um, single variable focused, mm-hmm. a hippie looking at the way NYU or Hopkins is doing their work, right. you know, would probably go bananas. Yeah. Like, Why are you using that song? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you in a hospital? Yeah. Um, but what, what kind of factors would, did you want to maybe comment on? Um, well, specifically in scientific research, I think that, so there's a huge, um, advantage of isolation of the purity of the, um, psychedelic being used. So being it, let's say MDMA treatment for like PTSD. And then there's the treatment with um, like psilocybin, but they're using like, I believe, and you know, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe they're using like synthetic psilocybin. So you're not going to have the same effect that if you were to do this therapeutic treatment with mushrooms, because there's still other psychedelic compounds, even though a little less present in mushrooms, then there would be in a synthesized very isolated it's probably like you know psilocybin or you know it'll turn into psilocin um and so the comments i would make there is that i think that it's just important to collect the research on the ice the effects of the isolated compounds and then we can progress further into adding more of the other things but the and the point I want to get across there, the reason why you don't want to jump into, okay, let's just take mushrooms 
Um, and which I, which I would, you know, if that's the path, then I would love that too. But I think that there would be more benefit from, you know, going from step one to step two, because you are going to, you know, there's too many variables now that could be affecting the experience. And then kind of touching back with you on how you said it would be in like this medical like kind of settings. I could see maps, you know, they're throwing in, you know, some kind of tribal looking like rugs in their therapy sessions and uh, like, you know, a picture of like a forest <laughs> or something right. to try to give it more of that nature feel. So I think that they're trying to do it, you know, like it's not the full traditional experience, but um, they are, you know, it, the, the scientific uh, research has to differ in some way. And that's, I guess, the way that it, it is right now, you know. Right. It's um, just getting, getting the public and getting like drug users more comfortable with the idea of like, this is how science is done mm-hmm. um, would probably be be helpful and um yeah and yes they are they're totally pulling in elements like like tribal looking rugs and and you know colored drapes and unfortunately a lot of these rooms they're working in are just not in great buildings Mm -hmm. and they're they're not even great rooms to begin with Mm -hmm. like often the researchers have to go to great lengths to uh make their rooms comfortable yeah that's uh really unfortunate because you know, rule number one, set, set and setting. And then you're brought into this <laughs> room that kind of sucks. <laughs> right. It's a tough thing, but they still do really well. Right. Which is interesting. Yeah. Like the Hopkins, yeah. the Hopkins research is, is astounding. It's amazing. In, in sub like less than perfect yeah. settings. They're, I mean, they're, they're saying that even, even the people that had terrible demonic trips still had the beneficial therapeutic effects like like afterwards like even though it was like a scary situation or whatever i don't know what they didn't really define like what the bad trip was but they still said that they still experienced the benefits of the therapeutic um you know um what what would come out of the therapy just as much as the people that had great trips and so like you know, of course, set and set and setting is you know, everything, but you know the data that just going through that experience, regardless of how it really went, it was still effective way more than your antidepressants that are available from big pharma that you have to take every day and are extremely like low efficacy rate. And so, I'm, thumbs up to that those people doing that research. Yeah. Um, I read something recently about how, you know, science should be applauded less and the scientists should be applauded much more because it's such grueling work. I've, you know, once in a while I get excited, like, oh, sh- maybe I should have like gone to grad school. Maybe I should still go to grad school. I'm like, fuck no. Don't go back to school. Don't go back. <laughs> was, it's a yeah. trap. <laughs> right. It's, a, it's an interesting thing though, right? Like I, I will do it. Well, if and when I have enough money yeah. um, to pay for it outright, yeah, right? Yeah. Like I don't want the debt. Yes, that's the, that's what I meant by trap, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a financial trap. You could get all of this information online. I think that we're all also moving into a culture where degrees are not going to matter much. Like it, typically it's now seen in a lot of like of the tech industry where you're not going to need a degree it depends on how well you can code or whatever it is you do, you know, uh, and what projects you've worked on rather than what degree do you have? Do you have a professional engineering license? You know, like, or do you have PhD? It's like some industries are like, it's just experience. Right. Like show me your, uh, mass spec, grading <laughs> grade sheet on your MDMA. <laughs> um, how pure, how pure are you able to get to? Or like, yeah, like there's so many different avenues here, legal or otherwise, right? Like you could be a yeah. 
just a project manager, an accountant. You could do so many things with these psychedelic groups that are coming online. Yeah. And there's so many, there's so many avenues. Oh, like you and I chatted definitely. and just went through like 20 different product <laughs> ideas the other day. Definitely. And I had a, I had this great, great, uh, connection with this beautiful girl that I met at a concert and she just saw my posts, you know, and I keep my, my account private for several reasons, but she was just like, Hey, like, you know, uh, you know, what you're posting has really been reaching out to me. I really would love to get into, you know, psychedelic therapy, but like, I, you know, I don't have, you know, such and such skills. Do you think I need to go back to school? And she's asking me, you know, this advice. And I was like, you can go back to school if your ultimate idea is to be like, you know, like research or the therapist, but you could, you know, also just help in like being like the media person or there's, there's so many components to it. Um, you know, I don't want to call it a business, but like a, a model, you know, there's so many like components to it. So I was just talking to her about, you know, there's multiple ways that you can contribute to this community and learn about it without having this totally, you know, science-based degree on your hand. Um, just throw that yeah, out there. It's very expensive. I, somebody reached out recently to ask if they should go to Naropa or not. It's a, you know, very nice, beautiful school in the middle of Boulder. It's like Buddhist orientation. So that's like appealing to a lot of Americans and the, my my advice was like, do you, do you really want to go back to school? Number one. And do you really want to go to a very expensive school? Mm-hmm. Like you could do very similar stuff. Well, not similar. It's not similar stuff. It's a totally different thing, but you could get a degree from a local or state school for like an eighth of the money. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a variety of schools that I could have chosen from doing a chemical engineering degree, but like at the end of the day, you are paying a loan in order to get back a return. Like it's a, you know, uh, right. and so a lot of people, you know, at that age don't know that. And then if you are older and still know, it's like, it's just, it's just so much money. <laughs> Education is just so expensive. And it's like, I feel like the two things that'll just, you know, plummet you in debt right off the bat is like education and, and then like buying a car, <laughs> right. buying a car that you, like off a lease or, or a car that you don't really need. <laughs> right. It's an interesting deal. Like how, how does a young person, you know, aged what, 18, 19, 20 make a decision about what they, would like to do for the rest of their oh, lives. So like terrible. that proposition alone <laughs> is tough. Yeah. So like yeah. I have this feeling that there needs to be more like very cheap liberal, liberal arts degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, so that people can just like hang out and get smarter. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, later explore their life. I think, you it, know, perhaps that's just traveling the world. I mm-hmm. don't know. And, and I think there's like startups doing that. They like, will get around and like, you know, you still have to pay for it, but it's a little cheaper. And like, you kind of just like figure out like, what are your strengths and your weaknesses and your passions? Um, and I have no clue of, uh, what (laughs) those programs are called, but like they are available, but they're just like, so not known. And so people like, you know, like I just, I took my path because that's my parents, you know, hardcore, like strict Asians were like, you're going to college. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to expensive college. <laughs> Cause then, right. uh, I considered that factor, but a lot of people don't at first cause you know, they don't think about the consequences of having to pay their loans cause they don't do the Excel spreadsheet that we should do <laughs> to determine on how long it's going to take to pay back those loans with the cost the average salary that you would probably be making with that degree. (laughs) Right, 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 right. And then you factor in, you know, going to festivals and (laughs) it's all all off. Oh yeah. It's all off. It's all (laughs) off. You can't, you're now, you're now like how to rise a person trying to like, like break into the festival for free or, or, Oh, but I love that. I, ha- I love that if there's like a really true passion to get to festivals that, uh, um, that they let volunteers 
go to the, you volunteer, right. you volunteer for a day and then you get to go to the rest of the festival for free. I think that's like a really great system. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. So, Tep, I think we should wrap here. Cool. And I think we should definitely do one uh, again later, kind of breaking down, like, um, I guess, you know, maybe we can split it into two parts, like chemistry part one, and then, you know, perhaps like science generally. Yeah. And I could be definitely, um, you know, more prepared because, uh, like you were saying, like I was a little less prepared for this one. <laughs> But I'm I'm, gl- I'm yeah, glad the direction no it went into, and I'm I'm excited definitely for part two, definitely. So yeah, we can touch into absolutely. like um, I'd love to touch into like the chemistry, the analogs, and then I would love to talk about some of the work that I've been um, following of um, the coding, like the mixing of the drugs at cer- certain time durations, and how like like do do you know like how like a I think we discussed before, like how ketamine uh, feels totally different after, like if you're on MDMA, and you take it. We chatted about that briefly. Yeah. yeah I would um, love that to be a part of the next discussion because like always people are like, what you're going to do ketamine or like people that do Coke to come down after a long night. They're like, what? <laughs> and it's because of like where your receptor foundation is at, the, at that time like is it, it, it gives you a totally different experience. And I still, I think that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's wrap it here. And until Ooh. next time. Awesome. It was really great chatting with you. And there you have it. Tap. I hope y'all enjoyed that one. It was fun for me. I listened to it over and I don't, I don't do that too often, honestly. And, and it was really fun think there was some really valuable stuff in there and, and hope you agree. So uh, again, if you want to support the show, it'd be great if you could tell a friend. We've been putting out over 150 episodes and it would be great to get more listeners. We, we always want more people to tune in and to let us know what they're thinking about. So if you want to give us some feedback, we'd love reviews on iTunes or Facebook. If you need help doing that, just email us. We'll send you some directions and we'd, we'd just love to see some great reviews up there. And we have a huge Facebook group uh, coming up on 2,300 people in there, I think. And there's a lot of vibrant discussion. So I would love to have you join us and and post questions there. Um, Just search Psychedelics Today group and you can apply. And always remember, we've got some free classes. Um, You can check out our free classes at psychedelicstoday.teachable.com and check out what we've got to offer, including a course on spiritual emergence, psychosis, or... I think it's just called spiritual emergence or psychosis and another one uh, called eight common mistakes, eight common psychedelic mistakes. And again, you can check that out at psychedelics today. All right. I think that's enough for now. <laughs> we'll see you again next week. And until then, this is Joe Moore signing off. 